Welcome to The Old Men of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 144, Darius Garland and J.B. Bickerstaff. It is Cavs week here on The Old Man of the Three. Before we get to Garland and Bickerstaff, as a reminder, we have a newsletter, a farewell to takes, very easy to subscribe. We have interesting stuff happening around the league that we write about. We have Tommy's favorite thing he ate this week. We have my wine of the week, our stat of the week. It's a lot of fun. It's short, sweet, and also sometimes has exclusive content from Jason when he's not overwhelmed with all the other stuff he has to do. We also have a Monday show, The Old Man and the Three Things. We've had a lot of fun doing these shows. They're about 30 minutes. It's just Tommy and I. We touch on three pertinent topical things around the NBA. That's every Monday. That's available exclusively on Amazon Music. And, Tommy, we have one more exciting announcement. Today we debuted our YouTube exclusive video series in partnership with DraftKings Sportsbook, Islands in the League. We can't stay off the Hemingway references. For those that don't know, Islands in the Stream was the essentially the precursor to The Old Man in the Sea. It's a three-act novel, and this is a three-act show. My monologue is about all-star selections and why I think very strongly that the league should expand the all-star roster. Very persuasive case. Get rid of the alternates. Yep. Get rid of the alternates. Let's just have the 15 best players, whether it's each, each conference or add just the 30, add them together, 30 best players in the league. There there needs to be more. Our talent pool is so deep. We also had some fun with NBA Twitter, and we talked to Josh Applebaum, our resident sports betting expert. Shout out to Jason and Kylie for Kylie all, makes all her, three all three of you guys this is a this was an ordeal <laughs> Kylie makes her video debut this is the NBA Twitter thing is one of the best things we've put out and next week Tommy our fourth live show this one coming from New Orleans my favorite city in America February 9th at the Civic Theater we have special guest Jose Alvarado and this week we announced our second guest CJ McCollum this is gonna be a lot of fun 8 p.m. show there are still some tickets available uh, I can't wait to be in front of the Pels 12. Can't wait to be in NOLA <laughs> going back. I'm sure there will be a stop at <laughs> Turkey and the Wolf. Positive. Positive. Tommy, Darius Garland, All-Star last year. We are recording this on Wednesday afternoon. All-Star reserves will be announced tomorrow night. So we will be a little late as to whether or not he makes his second straight All-Star team. It's really interesting to me, and we touch on this with him, Donovan Mitchell comes in in this trade and – my immediate thought was, how is this going to affect Garland? And Bickerstaff and Donovan Mitchell and Darius, to his credit as well, have figured out how to make this work seamlessly. And it's actually uncanny. His usage rate stayed basically the same to last year. His counting stats and his efficiency stayed the same to last year. To me, he's having another all-star caliber season. Yeah. So a question for you. Our favorite stat, Raptor, was on there earlier today. Darius and Donovan are tied for 10th in Raptor currently. The only uh, team that has two guys in the top 10 are the Cavaliers. So I want to hear your thoughts and sort of where they are right now in general, but clearly that that sort of means that the guy's having an all-star season. But also, is that a thing that is promising for them looking forward as we start to talk about the playoffs and where they are um, you know, heading into April and May? I'm very high on this team. I want to be very clear on that. And the metrics suggest that they're – better than their record. They have the number one overall defense. Before last night, they were a top 10 offense. They're 11th today, second best net rating. They're just fifth in the East. Their core group of guys, Evan Mobley, Jared Allen, Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, they're all under 26 years old. The future is very bright for this team and this franchise. They, they to me, have a great coach in J.B. Bickerstaff. Their issue has been clutch games. They're 16 and 15 after last night's loss to Miami in clutch games. Miami, by the way, won their 20th clutch game of the season last night. They're coming on strong. They're yeah. they're only, uh, I believe, two, uh, a game back now in the loss column of the Cavaliers for fifth place. They're playing really well. Bam's playing great. Jimmy, Tyler Hero, all that stuff. Um, so this is this to me is the problem with the Cavs right now is who that fifth closer is. And their offense tends to stagnate. And I think some of this is the decision J.B. Bickerstaff has about who to place in that fifth spot at the end of games. Karis LeVert, great player. His skill set is a little bit redundant with Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland because those guys all need the ball. So his skill set doesn't complement those guys. And you know that 
Mitchell and Garland are going to have the ball in their hands at the end of the game. Okoro and Stevens, there's some defensive prowess there, but not necessarily the spacing, the the, the three-point shooting that you would need. Chetty Osman, who has had big games, not a knock. You lose some things defensively with him. And he and he's never really been that consistent 40 plus percent shooter over the course of his career. I think this team is active at the trade deadline. Yep. And if they add the right guy to be the fifth guy, I think they're a real contender in the East. As currently constructed, I don't have them in tier one. I think that's fair, even though those metrics I listed, they're great. I think they're a great basketball team. I like what they're building. To me, they need to make a deal at the deadline. Besides uh, clutch score or clutch or clutch games, um, they're 25th in rebounding. Do you feel like that is another place where they look at at the deadline? And are you a little surprised by that when we talk about the size of this front court? Well, I, I'm not surprised. You know, it's it, it's interesting because I brought up Garland and his counting numbers. Jer- Jared Allen basically has the same counting numbers as last year. Evan Mobley does too. Uh, I, we we have talked a ton about Evan Mobley at different times. We talk with Garland and we talk with JB about Evan Mobley. If he can become a double double guy, I think that shifts a little bit. And I also think having two smaller guards affects rebounding. Yeah, uh, Mitchell is a fine defensive rebounder over the course of his career. Whether it's three and a half to four and a half rebounds a game, it's fine for a guard. Garland's, I think, under three rebounds a game. So they haven't, in terms of the defensive rating side, they haven't dropped off. The rebounding has been an issue. Um, Bickerstaff, I want to touch on him real briefly because I think he's done a fantastic job, and we <laughs> we bring this up with him. He took over in season for the Houston Rockets. Uh, Kevin McHale, for Kevin McHale, he took over in season for the Memphis Grizzlies, took over for D- David Fisdale. And currently he is with the Cavs. He took over in season for the Cavs and took over for John Beeline. And it feels like he's finally established himself in a great place with a great culture, with a front office that trusts him, with a timeline that works for him. Yeah. And it came across to me, he clearly knows a lot about basketball. The guy's got incredible people skills. Yeah. I mean, Darius mentions it. You know, I think we knew this before, but it was interesting to hear it from him. I mean, Donovan actually talked about it when we did the pod with him in the fall, even though he'd just gotten there, about how good JB is at talking to them. And, that, and you almost can't take it for granted because not every coach is like that. Exactly. Um, real briefly, I do want to touch on the impact of Donovan Mitchell because last year this was a team that surprised a lot of people with their early season success. Jared Allen got hurt. <laughs> Towards the end of the season, they tailed off. They ended up in the play-in game, but they were a 4-5-6 seed for much of the regular season. I think it's really interesting when you look at DraftKings Sportsbook and how the Donovan Mitchell trade affected the Cleveland Cavaliers' championship and Eastern Conference odds. When the championship odds opened at DraftKings last May, they were at plus 10,000. Right before they traded for Donovan, they were at plus 9,000. The day after the trade, they moved to plus 3,500. They're currently at plus 2,500. They have the 11th most money bet on them uh, of any team for for the championship. Fourth most in the East. Same thing. You see the same shift before and after the Donovan Mitchell trade. Plus 3,000 on August 31st. On September 1st, plus 1,600 after the Donovan Mitchell trade. They're currently sitting at plus 1,200. Again, I think those odds shift if they get a really good complimentary piece on the wing. They're an interesting bet because of how well they've played the Celtics. They're just interesting. An inter- they're an interesting. They're an, they they I think that they've been frustrating at times for their fans. I think the game against Miami last night was a good example of this. It's a game they probably should have won. But to your point, they have all the talent in the world and if they can add that complimentary piece, they don't have a lot of holes. I also really believe this and it's something I mention all the time on the podcast, on ESPN, I believe in culture, and I believe that this team has culture. We were very fortunate to spend some time with Donovan in person in October in Cleveland. Prior to sitting down with him, we spent some time at the practice facility. We actually watched them do their post-practice shooting, spent some time with Mike Ganzi and Kobe Altman and our boy Kevin Love. And it's clear to me that this team is building a championship culture. Yep. 
And I think that really matters. And I think you guys will see with this Darius interview. I mean, what a great dude. What a, just look, what a nice kid. It's just amazing. A better player. Better player yes. than Bones Highland. But the smile and the energy, the whole interview, it's, it's yeah. Bones-esque. And I appreciate that. NBA fans, it's time to bring the hoops action to the palm of your hand with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Download the app now and sign up with code JJ. New customers can bet $5 on the NBA and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Let's get to our conversation with Cleveland Cavalier All-Star, Darius Garland. All right, let's welcome in Cleveland Cavalier All-Star, Darius Garland. Darius We are big fans of yours on the show. We can't thank you enough for the time. We appreciate this. We've been looking forward to this all week. So thanks for doing this, bro. No, thanks for having me. Um, Let's kind of assess where where your team is at right now. Uh, You're 31 and 21, fifth in the East. After an 8-1 start, just 23 and 20. Uh, Donovan has has missed some time. You've missed some time. But I look at you guys, and you're kind of sitting outside – of the Bucks and the Nets and the Celtics and the Sixers, but your first overall in defense, you have a top ten offense and you're number two in net rating. Like I, I, I could make the argument that you guys are a contender right now, even though your core is so young. Where do you sort of assess where you're at this season at this stage, fifty two games in? I think that we're in a good spot. Um, I mean, I think you guys always just talk about how young our core is um, and just like the centerpiece around everything. Hold on. Like, when you say you guys, what do you mean here? What do you mean uh, you guys? The media period. The media period. <laughs> Jay is media now. He's the, he's the <laughs> I talking. don't consider myself media, right? <laughs> I mean, just a lot of people, they say that we're super young, but um, a couple of us have been in the league for a while now, uh, especially added Donovan with the playoff experience that he has. Um, Jerry with some playoff games, Karis with some playoff games, um, even our veterans, K-Love, um, Ricky, Robin Lopez. I mean, we do have a lot of guys that has been in the league for a while, but we are super young. And um, I think that we have a shot. Um, we always say every day that we're in a good spot, but I think that we have a lot of potential to go. Um, we knew that it was going to take time adding Donovan, so we're not in a rush, but we definitely want to win right now. And that's our main priority. I, I was curious about this. We talked a little bit about this with Desmond Bain a couple weeks ago, Darius, and I feel like you guys are in a little bit of a similar spot in terms of, you know, you guys have gone from being kind of like the young, underrated hunters to now you're the hunter, you're the hunted. You know, you go places, you, you people know you're one of the best teams in the league. They know you're an all-star. They know Donovan, obviously. How has that shifted your mentality? You know, you're still so fresh in the league, but in terms of how you approach everything with almost like more of a target on your back. That's exactly what it is. Um, I just have a target on my back now. Um, I feel like that I'm one of the top 24 players in this league and um, especially one of the top young guards. So everybody's going to come after me, um, especially with our backcourt with Donovan um, being top five in the East, one of the best young teams in the league. I mean, we're definitely targeted. Um, We love the challenge. Everybody brings it literally every game that we play. They always just have that circled on their calendar. So we always have to be 10 toes down. We have to be solid every game. Uh, We have to try to play one of our best games every game because we know that we're targeted and we're one of the top teams in the East. The timing of this interview is not optimal, Tommy, because we're recording this on Monday. And I do believe that on Thursday night, they're announcing the all-star starter reserves. Your teammate, Dean Wade, had some threatening words for the rest of the NBA. If you're not named a starter... um, (laughs) But in all seriousness, being named starter last year, I, I assume that was ex- extremely meaningful, especially to do it in just your third year. Does it matter as much this year, or is this is this a is this a real thing for the rest of your career? Like I I need to be in the All Star game. I'm that good. Um, I mean, of course, I would love to be an All Star every year. Um, I mean, that's definitely one of my goals, uh, just to be an All Star. I just don't, it doesn't sound right to have just one all-star. I would love to be a multiple. (laughs) Uh, So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it would be a big deal if I made all-star this year. But, um, I mean, my main focus is winning. Uh, We have a lot of talent around us, uh, really good talented group. So, 
I want to go to the playoffs. I haven't been to the playoffs. Uh, really had a chance last year in the play-ins, a couple playing games. So my main goal is to make the playoffs. But if All-Star was in the mix, I would love it. You basically have the same use. I do. I have a question, actually, before I get into all of this. Do you pay attention or do you, are you aware of like the the most basic of advanced stats? And were you aware of any advanced stats coming out of college? Because I certainly wasn't coming out of college, but they're they're all the lingo in the NBA. Yeah, I know a couple uh, coming out of college, but I don't really like to get into all the numbers and statistics as much anymore. Um, I mean, I did a little bit my rookie year, but the numbers were just kind of confusing and a little bit too much for me. So I just tried to go out there just play on my game. Okay. Well, we're going to bring up some numbers throughout this interview, but here's one. Here's one. Uh, your usage rate from last year is essentially the same. Um, and, and you had a bigger jump, especially the last half of the season, uh, in terms of the possessions you used. Your efficiency is essentially the same. Your counting stats are essentially the same. And that's after adding Donovan, who's another high usage player. When you guys traded for him, obviously the excitement was there to add a player of Donovan's caliber. Were you concerned at all that there may be an impact on sort of what you do best on the basketball court, given that he also needs the ball in his hands? No, not really. Not at all, actually. Um, I mean, I used to watch Donovan when I was younger. Well, I mean, he's just a little bit older than me, but when he was in Utah, like his rookie year and on, um, I mean, he's a scorer. He's really elite at it. So um, I used to watch, like, last summer when we got the trade done, I used to watch a lot of Utah games and uh, just see what Mike Conley did, try to get him some easy shots when he was in Utah. And uh, just try to just recreate that, basically, but still have my aggressiveness throughout the game. I think the interesting thing is I was – there was a article in, on Cleveland.com, I assume is y'all's – one of y'all's beat writers, I'm not familiar, but cleveland.com had a, this great article talking about this these two roles that you have, um, the hunter and the distributor. And JB said that you are dissecting the game rather than relying on your natural talent. He's being cer cerebral out there. That growth there, just even from your first year, what's, what's an example of that? Like, wh How does that play out on the basketball court? in terms of being more cerebral, thinking the game more, and and sort of balancing that line between being a scorer and being a facilitator? So my method is just to just fill out the game, really. Um, in the first quarter, I just try to get everybody involved, uh, see how the defense is playing pick and rolls with me, Evan, or J.A., um, see if they're in drop, see if they're high up on the screen, just up to touch. So I could just hit them at the fours and the fives over the top in the roll. Um, just try to get Donovan rolling early, just get him some easy shots, try to break the paint as much as I can, uh, look for spray outs, uh, get Isaac involved a lot more, just try to hit him on a break for fast break, easy layups. So that's like my first quarter method. Then second quarter, I'm starting to get more aggressive. Uh, just try to fill off the game a little bit more because I'm getting everybody involved early in the first quarter. Everything opens up in the second. So I just try to, through it, throughout the entire game, just try to keep that entire method, really. And then the fourth quarter comes, that's when I have to be aggressive. Uh, that's when Donovan's already rolling. Uh, Evan made a couple shots. Jared got a few lobs. So that's how I just try to play the game throughout the game. I had a teammate in L.A., Chris Paul, of course. He was, to me, the best I played with using that method. He knew that I like to run around early, so he would get me going. Uh, he'd catch DJ with a lob, Blake with a pocket pass. Um, eventually, he got a little more aggressive in his mid-range. He'd occasionally shoot a spot up three. But then as we got deeper into the second half, he really looked to be more of a scorer. And I always used to say to myself, I am so fucking jealous of those guys <laughs> that have the luxury of the ball in their hands so much that they get to decide to do that. I mean, there were years I probably averaged 16 points a game and I would touch the ball 53 seconds a game. I, I didn't have that luxury. It was either shoot it or move it. <laughs> well, Darius, so we're going to get into your, some of your background stuff in a second. When do you feel like you just like on a personal level established that feel and that comfort where you could, we, 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 like, we like to talk about like taking the game slowly, 
like where you can have the patience to do that rather than just, you know, coming out and just trying to do your thing right away? Uh, it really started growing my second year. Um, had the ball in my hand a lot more. Um, Colin Sexy, he had went out early in the season, so I had the ball in my hand way more. Um, and that's when I just started filling out the game. I started watching a lot more film just to see how guys was playing me. Um, and I got more aggressive. So when I got aggressive, it was, it felt like I was just on Garbo for like a whole stretch for like a couple months. So, um, I mean, just filling it out, it was a lot more easier. Uh, the game has slowed down for me a lot. So I was just making reads and just trying to make plays for others. And it became really easy for me. Also on cleveland.com. This is another article that I found in doing the research on this. Um, and these are sort of unflattering things, but I found I found this to be hilarious. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, there was an article in June of 2020. So this is probably three weeks before we all went down to the NBA bubble. Uh, the headline was Darius Garland was the NBA's worst player. Should he get a pass? And then they listed these advanced stats, win shares, value of replacement player, RPM. Apparently, I didn't even know this. I was playing in the league. Apparently, you were last in the league in all these statistical categories. I looked up, our one of our favorite stats is Raptor. I looked up Raptor, which is a sort of all-encompassing stat today. Um, you're tied for 12th overall in the NBA in wins above replacement player, and you're 17th overall in this <laughs> Raptor stat. And I, I think it speaks to, obviously, your growth, but in general, how someone like yourself who's only played five games in college and then comes into the NBA and you're in a, a developing on a developing team, I don't think we give young players enough time before making judgment calls. I mean, you you went from that and basically a season and a half later, you were an all star. Do you feel like that's just the general vibe of fans in the media now? Like we want it so quickly? Yes, for sure. Uh, especially when you drafted a lottery pick, they expect you to just come in the league and just dominate from the jump. Um, but I mean, I came in as a 19 year old kid with five games under my belt in college, uh, coming off a torn meniscus. And so I'm basically fresh out of high school, coming in playing against grown men with a family to provide for. So, I mean, yeah, it was definitely tough coming in my rookie year, especially with the rebuilding years that we had. And, um, the media just have to give young guys, kids, basically, some time just to grow. Um, I mean, I just grow through experiences, just with games. They played me a lot, uh, went through a lot of bumps and bruises, uh, a lot of mistakes, and I just watched a lot of film and just worked on it. So I think just the growing process, it, it really matters to these guys. Um, I mean, we're not in the league for any reason. Guys see the talent, but it, you just have to grow in it. I mean, just take time, really. Yeah. I think a great example, by the way, you brought up something that I think is really important, and that is being able to learn from your mistakes. And there are situations where younger players maybe have a shorter leash, and there are situations where players are really allowed to grow, to, to grow through their mistakes. And there's a sort of compounding factor to that in terms of development. A great example to me of that is the Warriors' young players, right? Kaminga, Moody... James Wiseman, they don't have the luxury of playing 30 to 35 minutes every night and getting plays called for them and being able to play through their mistakes. And then you have the young players in Houston, like Jalen Green, Shen Goon, Jabari Smith, Kevin Porter Jr. They have that luxury. And I think it's really, I think it's really challenging for any young player to learn from their mistakes, but especially if you're in a situation where you have sort of a, a shorter leash. And I I guess you felt like you did not have a shorter leash. You were actually able to play through your mistakes. Yeah, for sure. They let me play through all my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Almost having double doubles and turnovers. And <laughs> double doubles and turnovers. It, it was crazy. Um, but yeah, they let me play through everything. Um, I had a lot of good vets that I've looked up to um, that just literally let me just play and just let me play without my mistakes. They believed in me. Like Trish and Thompson, K-Love, they've been playing with Braun and championship runs, championships, and they just tell me just go out there and play. You have to learn through your mistakes. 
Um, and I definitely apologize to him my rookie year because those old guys are just running around after all my turnovers and <laughs> bad shots and stuff like that. So <laughs> my rookie year was definitely tough for sure. I wanted, I wanted to go back a little bit, Darius, to talk about um, – Actually, before you got to Vandy, what was the what was the Tennessee basketball scene like? Um, we had a couple of challenging games in like high school. Um, J.S. Wiseman, he definitely went to my rival high school, so I played him and stayed in high school. Um, but other than that, it wasn't it wasn't a lot of talent. But my high school team, they definitely went on a, a national schedule in like my junior senior year. So I got us to play against a lot of talent. Um, played against Shea, um, Gilchrist, and um, Nikhil Alexander. They had a team in Tennessee, the school that they went to. So it was a couple of teams that were really good and had a couple of leaguers. But um, that was it pretty much. And then at Vandy, it was five games. I was not conference. And I think our toughest game was against USC and Kevin Porter. I think they were ranked like 21st in the country. Um, and then after that, it was <laughs> so I'm going. Uh, so in no, in no way, in terms of the level of competition you had played up to that point, you were, you were unprepared for your rookie season in the NBA. I mean, like high school AAU, I played with um, Bradley Bill Elite and we've had P Sham runs. So I play against all the no, top. I, yeah, I know. I know. I know. But I just, he asked about Tennessee and like, honestly, you had one of the most. <laughs> Legendary runs in any state's history. Four-time state champion. Three-time Tennessee Mr. Basketball. But, again, the five games at Vandy. When you when you got hurt and, and they announced that you'd be out for the season, did you – were you stressing? Like, honestly, t- take me through sort of the mentality there. Obviously, there's the, the, the piece about recovering and doing the rehab and, and getting your body right. But then there's the piece about – declaring for the draft and, and, and trying to get drafted? I was definitely stressing. Um, I was just kind of mad that my season was just cut short and we had a really good team at Vandy. Um, I was one of the first ones to commit and I literally tried to recruit everybody to Vandy, starting with Cam Reddish, uh, Simi Chateau, Aaron Neesmith, that's playing with Indiana now. Um, Saban Lee, he's with Phoenix now. He was already there. It was going to be his sophomore year. So we had a really good team, and I thought we had a really good chance of making a run. But, um, I mean, when I had this surgery, it was just, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know if my dreams will come true or just trying to make it to the NBA. Um, so I had a lot of setbacks. And I remember one day I'm sitting in a room, and I had to get like a little pick for my knee. So my parents just had to just replace it every day. And I literally just cried to them. I was like, I don't know if my dreams would come true. And they just looked at me and said, God would just do his work. So I just believed in that. Um, really just took my time with it. I didn't try to put as much time as in basketball because I didn't know if I would be able to play again for a long time. It was just something that I loved and something I never got away from in that period of time before so it was really tough um but I'm glad it's behind me I'm glad that I'm just healthy and able to play the game that I love right now yeah I can't I can't imagine going through that um getting ready you know I think any McDonald's All-American now any highly rated player the mentality is I'm going to go for a year and I'm going to declare for the draft and I you know apparently Cleveland likes you enough to give you a promise at the draft combine not a promise. Not a promise. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely wasn't a promise. Is there? Is there besides you and Kyrie? Are there any other recent comps of this of this small of a sample size being a top five pick? Uh, Wiseman. Wiseman. Yeah. It is rare, though. Yeah. You know what's interesting, though, Darius? You did you play EYBL or AAU? Like, I, did you you I did Peach Jam and stuff? Yeah, yeah. So Tommy, so. When I was in high school, there was the AAU circuit, there was the Adidas circuit, and there was the Nike circuit. And occasionally you'd go to one of these big tournaments, whether it was Peach Jam, the Super Showcase, Nationals, uh, Boo Williams Invitational, uh, Nike put something on in Portland. And occasionally you would go, and every now and then after a game, they would be like, oh, we kept a box score. 
you know, and you'd be like, oh, I get to see my stats. Now there's a whole database for e the EYBL is like a database that the pro scouts use. I don't even know why these kids go to college anymore. I really don't. <laughs> there's no reason. I'm a hater. Yes, I'm a hater. Don't go to college. Go don't to go to college. <laughs> Why go for a year? Would you, Darius? Like, would you, would you have done anything? Uh, sixteen, seventeen year old you now, would you have done anything differently? Not at all. I love my process. The process was super fun. Uh, I mean, recruitment was crazy. Just getting calls from every coach from around the country, um, just trying to sell their pitch. Really, just trying to get you to come to their college and play. Um, I mean, getting calls from some of the top coaches in the country that's super legendary that go down it in the books, literally. Um, it was super cool. Just hear that voice, just try to sell their pitch. It was it was super fun. I wouldn't change anything really. This is it's a big bummer for Vandy. It is it is a big bummer. <laughs> I mean, who you never know what's gonna happen with anything. The but best recruit in school history. Yeah, you would have fucking the Duke, murdered did Duke there. recruit you at all? <laughs> yeah. Uh Duke was actually one of my top fives. Oh, okay, no. See, I knew yeah. this. I knew you were my guy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, could you walk us through draft night? Ooh, draft night. Um, so this is a quick story. So my mom, she like our family is like super close and really big. So my mom literally invited about sixty people to the draft, I believe. And like some of the people from the league was like, "This is one of." The biggest parties that we ever had in the league, like for drafts. So I'm like, man, I didn't know it was going to be this many people. <laughs> so at my draft party, it was like 75 people there, all aunts, uncles, everybody. So I was super nervous off that. Like my time and family's here, just all eyes on me. So draft night, we're in the green room. Um, of course, Zion, Ja, RJ goes. And, um, so the Lakers had to trade with the Atlanta. So DeAndre Hunter goes before me and the fifth pick comes and all the cameras just come around me. So I'm like, so confused. I'm like, so they just going to give it away like this. <laughs> so I go to Cleveland, I go get my hat, uh, shake Adam's hand. And I mean, after that, everything was a blur. Um, all I remember is doing a lot of media, a lot of interviews and, after that, I just spent a lot of time with my family. And then the next day, I was off to Cleveland. Um, I did not know this, but your dad also played in the NBA. Seven seasons? Yeah. And was a bucket, apparently. Averaged like 14 and a half one season, I saw. Say he's a bucket. Oh, yeah. That's, if you average double figures in the NBA, you're a bucket. <laughs> all right? He scored like almost 5,000 career points. He's a bucket. All right? Um, the... The, the sort of impact that he had and and the the role that he played in your not only your your love for the game but just the um that your development as a young player and, and sort of sort of how you captured you know the, the passion of the game and 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 all the work that was put in uh I'm, I'm very curious about that selfishly because I'm coaching my eight-year-old now and he's obsessed and I want to know sort of how to how to handle that the right way and the wrong way um man when i came out my dad gave me a basketball and that's all i had so um i mean he's been there the entire way uh been in the gym with me countless hours um been my biggest fan but probably my biggest critic <laughs> most of the times um but yeah i mean he's always been in the gym with me our biggest thing was just working on pace just changing your speed when i was younger um I just see a lot of kids just going 100 miles per hour just with the ball in their hands and just playing at one speed. So my biggest thing as a child was just try to learn how to just change speeds. So it was one drill that I used to love. Like he would just clap his hands and I will just have to stop and just hold my dribble. And then he'd clap again. I will just change speeds into a whole other burst. So that was like one thing that I really loved because it just – it did something to me. Like, I think that just really created my shiftiness and my pace for the game. I think that was one of my biggest things I really loved about it. And one thing is I'll always keep in the back of my head that one thing that I learned that, that really means a lot to me was just changing my pace. Oh, you do it as well as anyone. I actually think this is a weird comp because you're totally different players, but 
like you and Markel Fultz, it's not just how you change pace with your dribble. To me, it's the your shiftiness with your body. Like sometimes that little drop dribble step back you use, that to me is like, I know Markel doesn't shoot threes, but he uses that from the mid-range. Like there's definitely some similarities there. I actually wanted to ask you about that your handle and how you developed it because I think there's there's guys do it different ways. I've talked to Kyrie about this, and he's like maniacal about drill work and combination dribble work. And then there's Jamal Crawford who claims he's never done a single ball handling drill. It's all based on pickup. Really? And, then, and then there's Steph who's like hooking himself up to sensors and meditating while he's ball handling. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. Was for you, was it just all about the drills? Mine was definitely drill work. Um, of course, started out with cones. Then, um, I mean, I'm just using my imagination at this point. Um, I'm really just trying to figure out where a defender will be and just use my imagination with different combos and uh, different body movements. I think the shiftiness part, I think I just learned that just naturally. Uh, just try to get my defender leaning and just try to really just see him out the picture. I want to just see the rim or another help defender. So I think just being crafty, um, different moving with your bodies, I think that just changed a lot in your ball handling skills. So you played varsity in eighth grade? Yeah. Were you were you cooking everyone then? Or did, did it take a little time? So my I was I wanted to play varsity the entire year of eighth grade, but the varsity head coach, Coach Hebe Smith, um, he brought me up in like beginning of state. So it's like the first round of state and it's my first varsity game. I come off the bench and I had like eight points, but it felt like I was really cooking <laughs> because it was varsity, but I wasn't really cooking in eighth grade <laughs> at all, actually. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> I had a question. Um, I had a question, Darius. We were talking earlier about just your your rookie year. We we talked to a lot of guys about this. We actually just talked to Paolo about this because it's just, you know, obviously he's going through this now. Did you have a moment um, early on, first couple games, that was like a welcome to the NBA moment? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were playing against the, against the Knicks, and um, Alfred Payton, he just comes out cooking me, literally cooking me. And I think we lose – and this was, Elford Payne had a triple-double. And that was like the first triple-double I've ever had on the league because it was early on in the season. And I'm thinking like Elford Payne just one regular guy in the league. But at that position, at the point guard position, it's a matchup literally every night. So I didn't know that. I came out in the garden thinking that was going to be a cool little smooth night. I have a good game our rookie year. And... It was total opposite. I mean, he's putting his shoulder in my chest. I can't breathe for a little bit. I mean, he's just literally little bro me everywhere on the floor, and it was crazy. Anybody can bust your ass in the NBA. Literally, it's such it a good it's such a good lesson to learn. I I told this story on the on the Knuckleheads podcast because um, Darius and Q. Their first question is always, "What was your welcome to NBA moment, or who's the first person to bust your ass?" And my, my the first person to bust my ass was Carlos Delfino. Got me with a back cut out of the post, dunked on my head. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think I'd ever really been dunked on before. Maybe Mo Ager, okay, Michigan State fans, but I hadn't really been dunked on like that. It was very embarrassing, but it was a good lesson to learn. It was a good lesson to learn. Head on a swivel. You brought up the point guard position because I think it's it's fascinating in today's NBA. We touched on this earlier about the responsibilities of that position. Night to night, you're expected to score. You're expected to create. You're expected expected to guard your position. There's a lot going on. Is, are there specific matchups, different guys that you get more excited for, or different guys that you're like, oh shit, it's going to be a tough night? Every night. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> answer. No, that's a great answer. I, it's like I'm completely honest with you. Every night is a matchup. Uh, it doesn't depend on who you're playing what night it is, they're going to lace up those sneakers and go at you. Um, and I think it's one of the hardest positions to play in basketball, for sure. Um, everybody's just so talented. Um, they can score it at a high level, like you said. 
they get their teammates involved and they can do so much. Um, and now with the the three ball in effect, they shoot from half court, so you have to pick them up a lot earlier. Uh, I mean, you just had a really huge risk because everybody's so shifty. Uh, everybody has some great ball handling skills and they can score the ball at a high level. So it's definitely a rough night, especially in the East. Uh, I mean, with Trey, um, I mean, Kai, I mean, the list of, of Jalen Brunson, of the, Tyrese list. Halliburton. It's, it's really tough. I mean, <laughs> Tyrese Halliburton at like 6'6", six, six, <laughs> really diamond everybody. Jalen Brunson putting his shoulder in your chest. I mean, it's it's a tough night every night, literally. This is an aside because this isn't your matchup, but can you help explain to us how the fuck LeBron is doing what he's doing right now? Oh, interesting. Because I'm no one can. It's it's the most amazing thing in sports. I think. I wish I could really tell you. It's it's crazy at 38 years old doing all of this. JJ, do you think that you can still play if you could, you know, still <laughs> get fucked, out there? That's fucked up. Fucked up. I'm really asking you seriously. I, if I had, here's, I'll answer this honestly. I still need to get surgery on my Achilles. So the, the, could I play a season? No, I could not play a season. If you gave me a week and said, you've got to play 22 minutes in a Tuesday night regular season game, I get you 15. 15? I, may, 15, I may give up 22, but I could get you 15. <laughs> it was, was crazy. Bron and I are the same age. What's crazy to me is not just that he's doing it. I think about the miles that I had on my body at the end, and they were a lot. Like I, I, you know, I was in the playoffs, played in a lot of regular season games. I think I played in over a thousand. I, I put a lot on my body in the off season. This dude is in year twenty. He's, I think, he's had one relatively serious injury. That first year in LA, he missed a significant amount of time. I, outside of that, I can't think of any other significant injury. He's played in Olympics. Uh, he's played deep into June, whatever it is, eight times, nine times. That, to me, is the most remarkable thing. And I I don't get tired of talking about it because it's never been done before. It's like a novel thing. I get this newsletter, Darius, every morning um, from one of our ESPN guys with stats. And, and ever since LeBron turned 38, every morning it's... LeBron is the first player to do this at age 38 or older. The only player to ever do what LeBron did last night, Kobe Bryant, after the age of 38. Kobe did it once. LeBron has now done it five times since January. <laughs> and you're like, what the it's fuck, crazy. dude? It's when, ridiculous. When did you realize how good Evan Mobley is? His rookie year. <laughs> like right away? Like day one? Right away. He came into training camp and, I mean, you can see all the tools that he has. Um, I mean, literally everything, turn around, fade, hook shot with both hands. Um, he can shoot the tray ball, which he's still growing at. Um, and we don't even have to talk about defensively because everybody knows what he does. Um, uh, I mean, any seven foot, I call him a unicorn. I mean, it's not a lot of guys that can just come in and just do what he does or even like growing into his body and, just learning little things that just comes with experience. It's, it's really amazing. Darius, we spoke with uh, your coach, J.B. Bickerstaff, and we got to spend some time with him as well in Cleveland when we had Donovan on the pod in October. Um, and I'm, I've am i been a J.B. Bickerstaff fan forever. Um, just think he's an awesome guy. What do you what do you think his biggest strength is as a, as a head coach? He really knows how to talk to us. Um, I think it's really hard for some people just to figure out how to talk to different people and different age groups and different guys that just takes things differently. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things I learned from early on. You just know how to talk to everyone and get everyone on the same page. And I mean, it's just a rock solid foundation that he always just has. And that's with our coaching staff, with our players, um, physical team. I mean, it's everybody. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody's on the same regiment. And um, that's one thing I really love about him, that he just knows how to talk to a lot of people in different ways and try to get them in the same foundation that we are. What was going through your head uh, on Donovan's 70-pointer? What am I watching right now? <laughs> Did you know? Could you tell? Were you looking at the, were you looking at the scoreboard at, the, at, at how where he was going with it? 
Yeah, for sure. And then it was the way like the game was going. Like we needed literally every bucket. So it was like, okay, he started to really heat up a little bit. And I, I remember it was like one time out, I look at him. I'm like, bro, you might can, you can do this. <laughs> you can get to 70 if you really want to. And then he was like, bro, just, just let us win. Just let us win. I'm like, all right, you got it. But if we get to 70, this is going to be really crazy. This is going to be in history. So it was super cool to see the 71 ball. So I didn't play that game. So oh, I'm shit, watching you're right. yeah, yeah. 48. <laughs> so I became a fan when he got to like 30. <laughs> when you had 51 last year, or did, it was this year, earlier this year, right? Or yeah, the fall. this year. Yeah, when you had 51, um, was that your favorite individual performance or have you had another one maybe that was fewer points that you just you sort of felt the best about in retrospect? The 51 was crazy. I think the 51 was definitely up there for me, but we lost the game. So I think like our second game against Boston where we played them at home, we went into overtime. I think that was one of my favorite games that I've had this season um, because it was, it was one of the big games. Uh, I think it was like ESPN game, primetime, uh, going against another great backcourt with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Um, and we won, so that just put the cherry on top of it. But the 51 was definitely up there. If we had one, that would definitely be number one for me, but I'll take the Boston game. Darius, I got one more question for you, and it's, it's related to the Cavs. Uh, and it's going back to what we started the conversation with, just in terms of, the ceiling of this team, one of the interesting stats that I found today was clutch time performance. And if you look at the teams ahead of you guys in the standings right now, Boston 16 and 7 in clutch games, 76 or 16 and 8, Bucks 17 and 6, Nets 19 and 7, you guys are 16 and 14. Your defense in particular has been great in clutch time. The offense has underperformed relative to how you guys have played for the majority of the season. What do you think you guys need to do better in clutch time to get better looks? Uh, we just have to be on the same page. Um, just let the offense come to us. And we just have to settle down. I think that we're always in a rush during crunch time. We just have to just put people in different spots. Um, and then just let us play our, out our offense. I think our offense is pretty good. Um, just have to figure out different ways to manipulate the defense just to figure out how to get different mismatches um, because all eyes going to be on me and Donovan, of course. So just trying to get different mismatches just to get easy buckets, easier looks for someone else, um, get a mismatch for Evan or Jay in the post and see if they can get an easy two for us. And then um, our ISO spacing is definitely has to get a lot better. Uh, just try to put people in the right position just to get easy shots. I like it. Is there is there a thing, you know, we've talked about your journey so far just since your rookie year. Is there a thing you wish you knew, um, you know, November of your rookie year that you know now? Just about the league. Really just trying to get on a, just get on the schedule. Um, just having your plan every day. Um, I mean, it's really this season is just super long. So just try to put in good amount of sleep, the weight room, extra shots, uh, treatment is really huge for a long season. So just having my strict program that I'm always just doing every day. I think if I would have knew that a little bit earlier, it would have been a lot more easier for me just as a basketball player itself and just doing stuff off the court, just trying to have times to talk to family that you don't see often, uh, see my parents a lot more. But uh, now I think I have my I have my schedule down packed now, so it's a lot easier. And uh, I'm just on that strict program really every day. I love to hear that. Routine is everything, and the input is the only thing you can really control in the NBA. Can't always control the result, but the input you can't control. Darius, uh, thank you for joining us. This has been a lot of fun, and uh, good luck the rest of the way, man. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. Thanks, Thanks, bro. That 8 a.m. class seemed like a good idea at the time, but by week three, you realized you needed your bacon, egg, and cheese and an iced coffee to get you through. That's when DoorDash can save your morning. 
Get the back to school savings you really want and get unlimited free DoorDash delivery with DashPass. Just $4.99 a month for students. How worth it? So worth it. With zero delivery fees, exclusive items, and more than 25,000 members only offers nationwide, DashPass by DoorDash is everything you need to make this semester memorable. DashPass for students gets your delivery in an hour or less so you can satisfy the spur of the moment cravings. Or save even more with 5% DoorDash credits back on pickup orders. Dash Pass for Students gives you access to more than just your favorite restaurants, saving you grocery runs, convenience store trips, and they even have your back with gift shopping. And you can save even more with an annual membership, less than $50 a year for unlimited $0 delivery fees. For a limited time, our listeners can get 50% off up to a $20 value and $0 delivery fees when you download the DoorDash app and enter code ALWAYS. That's 50% off up to a $20 value and $0 delivery fees when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code ALWAYS. Don't forget, that's code ALWAYS for up to 50% off up to a $20 value and $0 delivery fees with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. All right, let's get to another round of the coaching series, our conversation with Cleveland Cavalier head coach, J.B. Bickerstaff. All right, let's welcome in head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers, J.B. Bickerstaff. J.B., we have talked about this for months, and I'm glad we finally made this happen. Thank you so much for joining us for the Old Man of the Threes coaching series. Uh, excited to talk to you today. No, I appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a while since we started talking about it. I, I thought you were going to leave me alone, but I'm glad you reached out. <laughs> Persistent. <laughs> it is well I you know first of all your your career is fascinating but I also am fascinated with your team and we're going to talk a bunch about this year's Cleveland Cavaliers team but I want to go back to the beginning of your coaching career uh your first coaching job in the NBA was with the Charlotte Bobcats expansion team your dad Bernie Bickerstaff was the head coach uh and a long time uh executive and coach in the NBA for decades did you always know that coaching was in your future? I know you played at you know college basketball high level, but was coaching always a thing that you gravitated towards? Yeah, uh, you know, obviously, I would have loved to play as long as I possibly could, uh, but I always knew that at some point in time I was going to get into coaching. Uh, it was one of those things where you know I was very fortunate coming up. Like, you know, my biggest role models were in my house, and my dad would take me to practice with him. My mom was a school teacher. So I would go to practice with my dad and, you know, I mean, like as a kid being in those locker rooms and you know, being around those great players and great teams, it was just something that I always gravitated to and wanted to be a part of. The experience of coaching with your father, because there's a lot of chatter right now about Bronny potentially playing with LeBron in the future. Um, there's other examples in sports, uh, I'm sure, of, of you know, the Griffey's, of course, playing together. And there's probably examples of of a coach father son combination but that experience of coaching with him with the bobcats what did you sort of learn from that experience uh, i mean it, it was a lot of uh, you know making up for lost time also which i think that was the fun part about it for us is you know i mean because of his schedule growing up uh he was gone and traveling a lot and then i went to college and you know all those things um, so we didn't really get to spend as much time together as, you know, we would have liked. So when I got the job with him, you know how it is, you're together every single day, uh, for the entire season. And then, uh, so we, you know, our relationship really grew at that point. Uh, but you know, you're learning from someone who's given you the keys, you know, they're not holding anything back. They want you to be as successful as, po as you possibly can be. So they're pushing you to do more, uh, to push your own limits any question you had to ask, they would answer, you know, openly and honestly. And this is a guy who started coaching in the NBA in 1972. Uh, so we got together, I think it was 2004. Um, you know, so you think about a guy who has that much experience, seeing the NBA, you know, grow in leaps and bounds. And he was just willing to share as much knowledge as he possibly could. Uh, and again, he was somebody who I looked up to, you know, so I admired him and I admired the way that he handled the players. Uh, and he helped, you know, kind of mold the coach that I am now. JB, uh, JJ's getting into coaching now. He's, he's coaching his his kids' team. It's pretty intense. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> pretty intense. What was the your first thing in Charlotte? Um, what was what was the sort of hardest thing about the first like six months or so that you didn't expect when you started coaching? Um, well, I mean, it was 
I was 24 years old. So I was coaching guys that were older than me. Um, you know, Steve Smith was on that team. Brevin Knight was on that team. Uh, and, you know, those guys, and I, I talk about this a lot, is they taught me a lesson um, where I wasn't exactly sure uh, of what I was trying to do. We had a scout team put together, and I was trying to run them through uh, some scout plays. And, you know, I was nervous and fumbling and, you know, just didn't get it right. And, you know, I'll never forget the comment, you know, it's like, yeah, he's out here. He doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> and from that point forward, I was like, you know what? That will never happen again. Um, so I made sure that I was prepared and it taught me a lesson of how to earn people's respect. And they respect no matter what your age is. They respect if you're prepared. They respect if you're confident. Uh, but earning those guys with respect was extremely difficult, but it was extremely important to me as well. Uh, I, I don't know if you know Coach Collins or Coach Wojo or Coach Dawkins at all. Um, they were my assistant coaches at Duke. Uh, they got to participate with the USA basketball team uh, during all of Coach K's um, Olympic and World Championship runs. So they were in training camp with those guys. And one of the things they said to me was, we realized very early on when we were doing a scout or we were doing a film or we were breaking down skill work, development work, whatever you have it, we had to know exactly what we were talking about. Like if you don't know what you were talking about, NBA players are geniuses. They will yes. sniff out a phony <laughs> in a second. So what a valuable lesson to learn at 24 years old. Right. It was, and it was, it was my first year and I'll never forget. We were, we were still at the practice facility uh, in South Carolina. Like it, it's an experience that I have never forgotten. Um, but it's true. Like working with the NBA players, you know, people don't give them credit for how intelligent they are and how well they understand the game and how under they understand the fine points. You know what I mean? So, like, if you're explaining mm -hmm. something and somebody asks you a question and you don't have an answer on that spot, like, you have to be able to give them a why. Like, you know, they're willing to listen to different perspective and different point of views, but you have to be able to explain to them the why. And if you can't, again, you will not gain respect. Do you think that that changed your perspective versus, you know, maybe being a high school coach or a college coach or something like that, where there's a little bit more of a, not ego involved, but like you are, you would have been talking down to players in a way that did not exist with professionals? Yeah, I, but I also think like just being around my dad and how he dealt with players, um, you know, there was none of that. There was always the highest level of respect for everybody in the building, whether you were the number one player, the equipment guy, the ball boys, like, that's how we grew up was watching him and how he treated people and how, you know, the relationships that he had with players. Like we have so many guys that we consider family that he coached um, because of the way he treated them. Like they were all big brothers to us. So, um, you know, those are the relationships that we learned from and, you know, understanding that in the NBA, you know, at this point, you know, when he was coaching, you know, it was probably a, you know, 60, 40 split in the coach's favor. Like now we're in a full partnership. So if you can't work with guys and build relationships with guys on that 50, 50 level, you're going to struggle and, you know, talking down to them, belittling them, uh, you know, that's not going to go over well and you won't have much, much success if that's what you're trying to do. I want to follow up on something you said earlier um, about coaching under your dad inherently someone that wanted you to have success, wanted to give you the keys. I believe the opposite probably exists in the NBA as well with staffs. Have you experienced that at all? I, I don't, I'm not asking you to name names, but I think this is an important part of organizations. I think it's an important part of uh, teams, and I think it's an important part of, of coaching staffs. Yeah, I, I mean, definitely. Uh, and, and it's you know not necessarily – people didn't want to see me be successful, but it was more so, you know, people wanted to keep you in a box. Uh, and that's one of the things that I found that happened early in my career when I was, you know, so-called player development coach. Um, you know, they would tell you things like, we need you to get close to the players and build relationships with the players. But then when there was opportunities to advance, they would tell you, well, you're too close to the players and your relationships are more like friends. But, you know, whenever they needed you to do something, they would call on you to go, hey, you know, we need so-and-so player to do this. We know he doesn't want to do it, but he'll do it if you ask him to. 
Uh, so there was a lot of that, you know, when I was coming up early in my career um, where it was, you know, you know, build these relationships, but now you're too close to the players. So we want to keep you in this box because that's where in their mind I was most valuable to them. I'm going to have a, a follow-up question to that later, but I want to set the table before we get there. So you were an assistant coach uh, starting with the Bobcats, then with the Minnesota Timberwolves, then with the Houston Rockets. In 2015, you took over for McHale. I think it was 11 games into the season. Uh, then with the Memphis Grizzlies, uh, you were the associate head coach, and then you were named interim head coach. You took over for David Fisdale, and then you went to the <laughs> Cleveland Cavaliers. And in February of 2020, you took over for John Beeline. I don't know because I can't. I can't find the information. Is that a record? For, for how many times someone's been named head coach in the middle of the season in the NBA? I, I think myself and Alvin Gentry were tied. And then maybe when he got the Sacramento job, uh, he overtook that record to make it four. I, I think that's what it is. I'm not 100% sure on that, but uh, I, I know it's up in the top five for sure. So that relationship that you were, you were talking about, because this was actually one of the main questions I wanted to ask you about, because I think that experience of being an assistant coach and then being the head coach in the middle of the season when you've already gone through training camp, when you already have, uh, you know, a foundation of, of what you guys are doing, the relationship aspect of, of being an assistant coach versus being a head coach, how does that change? How does that stay the same? How did you sort of navigate that three times now? Well, you try to be consistent. You know what I mean? Like, you know, as an assistant coach, you're typically assigned, you know, two, three, four guys that are your main focus. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, and it, again, it was great being able to work with my dad. It was like, he never, you know, puts you in a box or on one side of the ball or with certain players. Like his whole thing was, if you want to be a head coach one day, you're going to have to learn how to manage 15 guys you're going to have to learn, you know, offense and defense. So he, you know, put into me early, like, no, you may work with these guys specifically, but as an assistant coach, your responsibility is to help the head coach. And the way you help the head coach is by making all of his players better and being able to put out fires before they grow uh, and become a head coach's problem. So in doing that, you build relationships with every player on the team to figure out like, what are his motivations? What makes him tick? And then you find his tails. Like you can tell, you know, two days before a guy is getting ready to explode because you can see the edge is coming if you know him well enough. Um, so that was one of the things that I tried to do at every stop was build relationships with everybody and try to earn everybody's respect um, on the team. And, you know, the guys, they're willing to do for you if they believe that you're willing to do for them. Um, so even in difficult situations, like taking over in the middle of the year is not easy by any means. Uh, you know, obviously a change has happened. So things aren't going the way that people expected them to go. And now it's your responsibility to try to correct whatever uh, is going you know, wrong or whatever changes had to be made without a whole lot of practice time. So you have to bank on the relationships with players that, Hey man, listen, like we're all in a tough situation. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of respect for you. I know how hard you work. I'm going to work as hard for you as you guys are working for us as coaches. And we're going to try to get it right. Um, and when you kind of take that approach, if your relationships are strong with the players, uh, they'll give you everything they have. In, in terms of your growth, do you feel like if you were to compare Houston versus Memphis, for example, that talking about like the instinct of knowing two days before a guy's going to blow up that you should you step in was that a natural progression do you feel like you just got better at it in the in the second job or, or like did you feel like in your time in Houston over time you sort of you sort of learned what you needed to know well you you learn but but what I tell tell everybody is like all of us assistant coaches swear we know what it's like to be a head coach and the challenges that are going to be in front of us but until you sit in that seat, you do not know uh, what's coming at you from an everyday standpoint. You know, it's not as much basketball as you would think. 
Uh, it's more personality and ego management than you would think. Um, it's more, me, you know, media interactions. It's conversations with agents, you know, working with the front office, trying to help push their plan while you're still trying to work with basketball. Now you're dealing with the analytics department. Like there's so many things that come into sitting in that seat uh, that, you know, people don't understand and you don't know uh, until you're sitting in that seat. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll never forget this. I'll tell you guys this story briefly, but it was the year I took over in Houston and Monty Williams was an assistant coach in Oklahoma city at the time. Uh, and I'm walking out of the building. They had just beaten us and Monty sees me walking and he's like, Hey, JB, man, like, you know, how are you doing? And I'm like, you know, I'm good. I'm good. He's like, no, 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 JB, how are you really doing? Um, and so he and I got into a conversation and in that conversation, he said to me, he said, JB, you know, one thing is like, everybody wants to be a head coach, but being a head coach isn't for everybody. Um, and you know, like I took that and I thought about it deeply and, you know, it is a decision that you have to make because it is a difficult job. Um, and you know, being an assistant coach is a great living. Uh, but you know, the challenge of being a head coach is awesome. Uh, if you're prepared for it as well. On those things you listed. There's the basketball component, of course, figuring out a game plan, running a practice, running a film session, coaching an actual basketball game, the X's and O's of it, rotations, all that stuff. I, not uncomplicated, not complicated, like there's some thought in there. The other part to me is very clearly complicated. How much of your bandwidth gets divided between the basketball stuff versus the personality management, dealing with the front office, dealing with your media obligations, going on other people's podcasts, things like that. I mean, how, <laughs> how much are we talking about here? What's the sort of division of, of your own sort of effort, input, labor, all that stuff? Uh, it's tough because, you know, again, one of the things that I try my best to do is to build genuine relationships with guys. And if you're going to do that, you're going to spend a ton of time uh, with 15 different guys, you know, 16 now for us with the two waves uh, included. But, you know, you spend a ton of time just trying to get to know them. And, you know, it's difficult early on because you start to carry a lot of their emotions, right? If a guy's coming to you with his problems, you know, those problems don't just dissipate. They start to become your problems. So, you know, learning how to navigate through that with each every individual you know, learning who their parents are, learning what their motivations are, you know, and then figuring out a way to make sure that everybody is still prioritizing team over themselves, right? And as a coach, also being able to create the type of environment where people want to come every single day and different people from different walks of life all want to come to that place and enjoy being there. Um, you know, it's not the old school stuffy, you know, coaches yelling and screaming two and a half hour practices. It's, you know, we're walking through shoot around while with little baby playing and, you know, trying to get the guys to buy in and enjoy it, but still be able to learn, um, you know, what's going on and how we're preparing for the game. Um, I'm extremely fortunate from a front office standpoint, like Kobe Altman has been awesome. Um, you know, we've got a great relationship. He's got a lot of trust in me. So we have conversations about basketball, but and he gives me his input, but he trusts me to make the right decisions. Uh, so it's not one of those things where I feel like I'm always looking over my shoulder. Like I believe in our partnership wholeheartedly, you know, the media piece, um, you know, you understand it and you respect the job that they have to do. Uh, but it's tough, you know, this year, uh, they cut some of our responsibilities down. It used to be after shoot around, before the game, and after the game. Now it's just before the game and after the game, and then after practice days. So it's not as bad as it was before. But um, you know, there's a lot, and you're trying to give them what they need also because you respect the job that they have to do. Uh, so I mean, it's it's tough. You know, what I mean, like you have to put together a great staff also. Uh, and I'm extremely fortunate with the group of guys that I have around me. They take a lot of that pressure and a lot of the weight off me, and I trust them to get the job done. But, um, you know, again, our job isn't easy. You know, it's a great one, but it's not an easy one. I wanted to make a point to something you talked about in terms of the investment in each individual player. I called a game in San Antonio a couple weeks ago 
when they played Golden State in the Alamo Dome, it was the game that set the attendance record. And uh, one of the great thrills for me now uh, calling games is that before every game, you know this, you get to spend about 15 minutes with each head coach. And when I was with Pop, one of the questions I asked him was about the juice for him having won, having accomplished so much, having been with one team for so long. Um, now they're in a rebuilding situation. There's clearly something that is is addictive about the the coaching piece and he he listed a few things but one of the things that really stood out was he said i i love figuring out which buttons to push for each individual player and i think the only way to do that right of course you have to get their respect right but i, I think the only way to do that right is to invest in the relationship and that can that can often be at least as a teammate for me that can often be one of the most challenging things about building a culture um, because that, that, that's a two-way street, if that makes sense. Right. No, for sure. Like they have to buy into you um, as well. And you know as well as I know, the one thing that NBA players can do quicker than anybody is smell bullshit, <laughs> right? So if you're fake or you're fraudulent, like they're going to smell you out. And once they smell you out, there's no coming back from that. Um, so, you know, being able to be genuine, um, and you know, the, the way I, I see it, JJ is like as NBA people, right. We've got the greatest jobs on the planet. We are extremely fortunate and blessed to be where we are. Um, so why would you want to be the guy to mess that up? Right. So, you know, we just try to make it a place where people can continue to enjoy it. Like we're going to work hard. We're going to get after it. Um, but we want people to be the best version of themselves. Like we don't ask Darius to be Donovan, Donovan to be Jared, Jared to be Evan. Like these are all different guys. So whatever it is that makes you the most comfortable, you're allowed to be who you are. And I think, you know, in that type of environment where people feel comfortable being themselves, they can flourish. Um, and you know, that's what team is all about, but that's what the environment is about. Even more important is like, you know, how can I make this guy from this place feel so comfortable that this guy from this other place can feel so comfortable and they both can be the best versions of themselves because that's what we're aiming for at the end of the day. Coach, we talk a lot about uh, knowing your role on the show um, and it's the NBA. So it's the, obviously every team, everybody on the team is uh, one of the best players in the world, but you're going to be in positions where, you know, guys are playing 10, 15 minutes a game who are used to being their best player on their college team or first team All-American or whatever it is. What's your best advice in terms of hammering that message home besides honesty? Is there a way that you can kind of like, you know, couch the message in terms of making sure that they know this is what's best for the team without, you know, in certain cases having a guy who's not used to having something like this happen, you know, it being foisted upon them? Yeah, it's what, what we do is before every season, uh, we hand out cards to guys about what their role is uh, and what our expectations of them are going to be for the season. Uh, and all those roles and expectations are focused on guys' strengths. And if you go out and play to your strengths, we complement one another, and now we become the best team that we can possibly be. You know, you're always going to battle and have those conversations uh, about minutes and guys want to be on the floor and you want guys who want to be on the floor. Uh, but, you know, obviously there's an understanding of, you know, kind of the pecking, pecking order and the hierarchy of how those minutes are laid out uh, and convincing guys that if you're prepared, no matter who you are, one through 15, at some point in time during the year, you're going to get an opportunity. Uh, there's 82 games and hopefully you make yourself your way into the playoffs uh, but injuries happen, you know, now rest happens. Uh, and if you're prepared, you know, you'll take advantage of your opportunity and whether it's here or somewhere else, you'll find value and you'll be able to have a successful career. You know, if you're the guy who doesn't prepare, doesn't stay in shape, all of a sudden your number's called, now you can't go out and perform. That's how careers are ended quickly and prematurely, to be honest with you. Uh, but if you're the guy who's ready when your number's called, uh, and then, you know, you're going to give yourself a chance to have a long lasting career here. And, you know, teams are looking for quality role players. You know, the best teams have three superstars. Right. And then there's 12 other guys around them that have to fit and make those guys better. 
So, you know, if you're willing to buy into that, you'll give yourself a chance. But, you know, we've seen how many guys that were top picks, lottery picks that didn't make it to their second deal because they couldn't figure that out. And they couldn't figure out how to be a role player or part of a team because it wasn't focused on them. Uh, and you've seen guys in the second round who've been able to figure it out and have 10, 12, 15 year careers because they're great role players. Kevin Love came on the podcast last season uh, and talked about the prior season. And there was a, a few incidents. Uh, I think he took the ball out of bounds one time and just tossed it into the other team. There was another, a couple other times that the body language wasn't great. Um, and he was open about it and how he didn't like his behavior. And now, you know, two seasons after that, it looks like he's having the time of his life. I mean, last year, you know, in the running for six man of the year, he's having another productive season this year. Um, specifically with him on that buy-in talk, like how did you get Kevin to buy into a new role on a developing team? Uh, I mean, just being honest, you know, and, and, you know, this goes back, Kevin and I, I was in Minnesota when we drafted Kevin. I was one of the assistant coaches on that staff. So that goes back 15 years now, I believe. Um, and, you know, going through the ups and downs of his rookie year, but just, you know, developing those relationships from back then. And you never know what the circle of NBA life is going to be and where you're going to end up uh, and who you're going to be working with. But, um, you know, Kevin is about the team. And that's the most important thing is like he understands who he is and how he fits uh, and the impact that he can have on younger players and the positive influence that he can have on guys. Uh, and he's taken pride in that. You know, he's been great for his teammates, uh, you know, give him so much credit for being, you know, an all-star, a champion, Olympic gold medalist, you know, probably a first ballot hall of famer and, you know, the willingness to sacrifice and take a step back for the greater good of a team isn't easy for guys who have gone through those things and accomplished those things. Um, but he took it head on. And he was willing to sacrifice. And I say this all the time, his sacrifice gave me a, the ability to coach our team in a different way. You know, him and Ricky Rubio, like them taking bench roles and sacrificing for the greater good of the team. There wasn't one of our young guys who could say anything about sacrifice because those two guys set the example. What was your initial response when you heard about the Donovan trade? I, I mean, I, obviously I was excited. Um, you know what I mean? Like when you have or the ability to acquire someone of the talent level of Donovan, um, you know, you're thrilled because you know the impact that he can have. Uh, you know, we love the guys that we have. And I'll say this, you know, again, like Lowry Markkinen was one of the favorite guys that I've ever coached. Um, you know, we believed him in, in a way, um, you know, that we thought his ceiling was extremely high. And I think you've seen that this year. And, you know, Donovan Mitchell was probably the only person that was going to get Lowry Markkinen from the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, that's how highly we believed in him and his skill set and his ability. Uh, again, but when you have a guy, you know, the, the Donovan, that things that Donovan has accomplished at the age that he did, like he fit right in. He was 25 at the time, turning 26 uh, when we got him. You know, his timeline fits with our young guys and he can show them things. You know, he's been to the playoffs. Uh, he's been an all-star. He's been in big games. And, you know, there was just the ability – for him to help catapult us uh, in a new direction, uh, you know, with his skill set, his talent, his leadership, uh, and, you know, his ability to mentor young guys, but being a young guy himself. Coach, I'm going to gas you up here a little bit. All right. <laughs> I'm going gonna, gonna to ask you a question in a second. The, the question is very simple. The question is, did you have any concerns prior to, let's say, training camp about how Donovan and Darius Garland were going to fit together? but I want to provide some context of how this season has gone so far. So first all of all, right. two undersized guards, right? We're sitting here 50 some games in the season and you guys are number one in the league in defense. So that was a, that was a question mark that maybe I had, maybe I had that question mark. I also thought, thought about two guys that, that need the ball in their hands a lot. I was looking this up today. Uh, <clears throat> Donovan Mitchell, he's used about 39% of his possessions in pick and roll. Darius has used about 42% uh, of his possessions in pick, pick and roll. Both those guys their efficiency, efficiency numbers are great. In fact, Donovan's in 96th percentile, shooting 60% effective field goal percentage. Darius is at 51. Spotting up off the ball, both those guys have been efficient. Obviously, less usage there in terms of percentage of uh, possessions used. But I, I thought maybe there would be a problem. And that specifically, maybe that Darius's numbers would take a step back. 
He's averaging the same amount of points and assists, basically shooting 40% from three, same exact usage rate. How did you sort of figure out how to maximize both of them? Uh, to, to be honest with you, like, you know, I know I appreciate the gas, but it had a lot to do with them. You know what I mean? Like they really wanted to make it work. And our conversations with them early on was this is not going to be a my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn type of offense. Right. We had to find a way that those two guys could blend the floor. But at the same time, you know, making their teammates better because that's what they're both capable of. Like, you know, we didn't want to stunt the growth of Evan Mobley or Jared Allen uh, because of adding another dynamic uh, high usage ball handler. Like we wanted to make sure that those guys continued to grow as well and that Donovan and Darius weren't stunting one another. Uh, and so what it comes down to is just being extremely unselfish. And it comes down to those two guys making the right play because of what the defense is doing in front of them. You know, we keep talking about it uh, like the other night uh, against Milwaukee when Evan had 38 points. Uh, you know, our guards did a great job of getting him the ball in the pocket, right? Because the defense was going to put two on them. He was going to be open and then he was going to have to make the next play. They know like Jared Allen feeds off of them. So what they're doing is, you know, they're putting each other like we've got combination actions where we put both of them and then one of the big guys involved in it uh, and do some different things. And then they just make the play that's right in front of them. They make the right play. And that's been our message is just continue to make the right play, continue to share the game uh, and it's going to work out. And, you know, again, those two guys have bought into it uh, and it's the environment and the culture of our team is, you know, trying to be as selfless as we possibly can be. What was going through your head uh, during the 70 point night? You know, it's wild because it's like, you're not even in, because we were down, I think we we're down 20 at halftime or something like that. Right. So because you're down in the game, you're just watching the score and you're trying to manage the game uh, to work your way back into the game. And it wasn't until the overtime where he hit a step back three pointer in the left slot where it gave us a little bit of breathing room where I actually looked up at the, you know, at the scoreboard uh, in, in the arena where it's got his numbers listed. And I was like, you know, I, I watch my, my, my language, but it was like, Oh my God, you know, <laughs> he's 65 points or something. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, and, and again, you're like watching it and you feel it, but you know, you're not actually counting the numbers and you're not, you know, paying attention to the numbers. You're looking at the scoreboard to try to get back in the game until you find that separation and you can actually take a step back and, you know, just understand like what you were witness to and what was actually going on. I haven't been in <clears throat> Cleveland's arena in a couple of years, but it's, it's to this day, it's always been my favorite all time scoreboard because it has the difference up there. It tells <laughs> the fans. I always thought that was funny as a player, 83, 80, and it'll, it'll tell you if one team's down three. You know, right. it'll, it'll tell you just in case you can't, you can't do the math, math on your up, own. Yeah. Not everybody got to go to Duke, Jacob. <laughs> I, 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 maybe it's Ohio. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not knocking anybody. I just I always found that to be interesting. Donovan's having a career year. Um, one of his, one of, if not his, his most efficient years. Uh, could you have envisioned him playing this well, though, when you first got him? You know, you know to be honest with you, I didn't know that he was this good. Um, you know, you only see him once a year or twice a year, excuse me, in the Western Conference and being in the East. And like you knew he could score the ball, right? Like he's always been able to score at a high clip. But when you're not around him every day, you don't know that he's a savant at the game of basketball, right? You don't know just because of his roles and what he was asked to do, you know, what a capable playmaker he is. And being a, you know, six, two, six, you know, smaller guard, like he can make those passes across court out of the pick and roll that you see the six, six guys making, you know, like you don't get to see all those things all the time. Uh, you know, you study your film and you watch and all those things, but you know, he is, you know, one of the elite of the elite offensive players in this league. Uh, and you get to know him and you realize how competitive he is. Right. Like he's taken defensive challenges for us this year um, where you're just like, you know, you're, you're you're wowed in the moment at the things he's capable of and how he can control guys in one on one situations. 
So, I mean, you know, to say I'm pleased uh, is an understatement, but it's just a credit to, you know, the work ethic he puts in. But to me, one of the things that I think has been great, and I, you know, so I don't want to keep rambling, but like, he's always wanted to be a part of the team. You know what I mean? Like as good as he is, he could have come in and tried to separate and make changes and make demands. But all he ever wanted to do was fit in and be a part of the team. And that made, you know, his transition easy because his teammates felt that uh, and they wanted to play with him and support him as well. I was, Coach, I was going to ask about uh, the Cavs franchise overall in the aftermath of LeBron and just the, you know, the, the championship run. Um, in terms of like resetting the culture and creating a new culture, has there been anything in particular um, that your staff has done, the players have done that you feel like has been particularly effective over the last couple of years? I mean, the buy-in to each other. And I think, you know, again, give Kobe uh, and Mike Ganzi and the front office crew a ton of credit. Um, they have highlighted character over talent. And I think, you know, we've been fortunate that we've gotten high character, talented players but we've never had to sacrifice, you know, and haven't sacrificed uh, character over talent. And, you know, that type of character gives, you know, coaches an opportunity to coach. It gives players an opportunity to get better. It gives them a chance to flourish um, because there is no one dragging anybody else down. Uh, they're always just pushing each other forward. Like there's healthy competition, obviously, you know, in practice and in shooting games, like, Everybody wants to be better than the next, but it's not in a way where they're going to take away from somebody else's successes or advancement. So, um, you know, I, I give those guys a ton of credit uh, for, you know, bringing the right type of human beings here and then hiring the right type of people as well. Like they've allowed me to put together a staff of people who I know and I'm extremely familiar with um, that are really good people. And, you know, they care about each other and care about the players in the game uh, in the same way that we all do uh, so that we're just all going out and just helping one another as best we can. I'm going to bring up one more conversation I had pregame because it, this ties in with exactly what you're talking about. Last week I had Taylor Jenkins uh, and the Memphis Grizzlies, and I think Memphis has done as, as good a job as anyone at drafting uh, and adding through um, – what I would have called marginal trades, not blockbuster trades. And I, I think if you look at how Kobe has built this team, it's been primarily through the draft and making timely trades for high character guys. Cleveland, like Memphis, this is not a knock. This is just reality. It's not necessarily a big free agent destination. And so when I asked Taylor about, you know, what, what's the common thread of guys that you are bringing in, I thought it was really interesting. He said something very similar. He said, we're, we're trying to bring in team first guys. And you bring in team first guys that are high character, highly competitive, that also have talent. All of a sudden you can build a real culture around that. I don't know that every team operates that way. And I, I really truly believe that is the correct way to operate. Yeah, I, we all wanna win a championship. There is something to be said about the day-to-day -day enjoyment of the job itself and the people you're working with. Yeah, I mean, you, JJ, you know it. Like you've been in good locker rooms and you know, I'm sure you've had some of your some some dicey ones, but you know what that feels like every single day. You know what I mean? Like if you're pulling into the parking garage and you're like, oh, shit, I got to go in here with these dudes again. Like that's miserable. And we're around each other so much that that's not the way that you want to feel every single day, because, you know, that carries over into your life. You take it home with you, you know, uh, and, and it's just an uncomfortable place to be. So the type of people that you do bring yourself surround yourself with and bring into your environment matters. Um, and, you know, sometimes some people will sacrifice over talent because they think there's a chance that they can push you, you know, you know, two, three games. Um, but over the long run, you know, is that worth it? And one of the things that, you know, we've learned over time is, you know, talent without chemistry or character is gonna underachieve. If you have chemistry and character, you give yourself a chance to overachieve. And if you've got both, obviously, character and talent, like you've got a chance to sustain and win championships for a long time, which is, you know, what everyone's goal is. Coach, is there, has, has there ever been a specific play call, like an ATO or something like that, that another coach has made that you've watched and been like, oh, fuck, I wish I had done that? 
Yeah, we, it, it, I mean, there's the, the the ones that piss you off the most are the ones that end up in like lob dunks. And this year it happened to us twice. And, it, you know, Mike Brown is one of my closest friends in the coaching industry. Like I've known him since I was 13 years old. And he got us on a rip screen lob dunk out of a timeout in Sacramento. And then he ran the same play and got us again here in Cleveland. And like that pissed me off beyond, you know, all levels of pissivity because we knew it was coming. You can see it happening right in front of you. Uh, we, you know, we have it on the film and then they're in the same set and boom, here comes the same lob dunk for the same player coming off the bench as well. So that's the one that sticks out in my mind. Um, and I cuss Mike Brown out every time I see him about it or talk to him. I wanted to ask a very broad question um, to follow that up about the philosophy around tactics, the philosophy around uh, the actual X's and O's, because the things we have talked about so far are talent and character and chemistry. Um, and you certainly can measure talent, but a, a lot of what we're talking about is the intangibles of basketball as a coach. What is your philosophy about how to move the needle? Assuming team A, team B, same character, same chemistry, same talent. Tactically, how do you get a, get a, get a leg up? Uh, well, I mean, for us, it's always started with our defense. Um, and, you know, the time that we put into our defense uh, and building our defense around the personnel that we have and how it, you know, has had to change a little bit over time, obviously, like last year, we had three seven footers that we were throwing at people. Uh, you know, that gave us a different advantage this year. You know, without Lowry, we just have the two big guys. But how do they protect the paint? How do they protect one another? And then how do our smalls protect them? So, um, you know, we start there and you can tell what type of people you have by their willingness to buy in to the defensive end of the floor. You know, the two things that we talk about all the time, and I know this is, you know, part of X's and O's, but it's you know, how selfless can you play the game and can you be the most competitive team on the floor, right? Like if you buy into those things, you know, there's been a lot of great coaches who have done the X's and O's differently, but can you get people to buy into those two things to go out and give themselves completely to whatever it is that your system is? And that's the selflessness and then the willingness to compete and win in one-on-one -on -one situations and things like that. So, um, you know, again, the defensive starts, you know, for us. And then offensively, you know, it comes down to how selfless do we play the game? Uh, we don't want to be an ISO, ISO, ISO team where everybody's standing and watching. You know, we feel like it's it's difficult for teams to chase people uh, with the way the rules are set up. You know, offense has the advantage. Um, but if you're just standing and everybody gets to watch and they get to shrink the floor around you, um, then it makes it easier for the defenses to guard you. But if you move them around a little bit and share the ball, uh, you're much more difficult to guard. There was some of this uh, when I was still playing, even as as late as five years ago, where if you wanted to run a pick and roll with your best roller and your best ball handler, you would just come down the court and run that. It wasn't <laughs> really... Everything now, I mean everything, starts with some sort of misdirection, whether that's a DHO on the side to the swing pass to a step up. Um, we've mentioned numerous times, nobody, when I ran Spain for the first time with the Clippers, I would start underneath the basket, DJ would go set the screen on Chris, and then I would go read it however I wanted to read it. I'd either set the back screen or slip out or whatever it may be. There's like 15 different ways to get into Spain now. And it's 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 actually one of my favorite things to watch on film is how creative teams have gotten here. I think that's a that's a huge change. There's only five-ish act actions you can run in the NBA. So disguising what you really want, disguising your true colors on a play. Like to me, that has got to bring some enjoyment as a coach. Yeah, I mean, that's the fun part, right? It's like you spend so much time watching other teams and you know, that's the chess match that's going on in front of you. As you know it, at some point in time, there's going to be a pick and roll. At some point in time, there's going to be, you know, the split action or there's going to be a wide pin down. Uh, you know I mean? Like there's not a whole lot of things that people are doing, but it's a matter of how do you get there? You know, what kind of false movement can you create to shift the defense? And, you know, 
offenses bank on the fact that defenses may shift once, but they're very likely not to shift a second or a third time. And then that's how you create your advantage. So, um, you know, there is some trickery involved, um, but that's the fun part. Like being able to take an offensive set, like you mentioned, the Spain action and, you know, how creatively can we get there? And what are all the things we can do in the beginning of that that end us up there, you know, and kind of trick the defense and put some pressure on them in different ways? So that is the enjoyable part, um, you know, and you do kind of, you know, you sit around with your assistant coaches uh, and go beautiful mind on the board, figuring out <laughs> different ways to come up with, you know, the same action that we've been running for a hundred years. Doc, everybody knew that I wanted to, I wanted to come over my left shoulder, go to my right, you know, and all my <laughs> catch and shoot stuff. And, and when I got to doc, we ran a couple actions to get it done. And then teams started top locking me or they would sniff the play out. And then it just got like, OD. I mean, I used to, I used to have to run like two false actions just to get to the third action. Brett Brown was the same way. We had a strength coach in, uh, in Philly, who's now the head of athletic performance with the Clippers, Todd Wright. And he would always say, they can catch you once, maybe. They can catch you twice, maybe. But there's no way they're catching you the third time. Right. <laughs> as a player, like I, I used to tell Doc, I'm like, Doc, this shit's exhausting, man. Is there any, is there any easier way <laughs> to get me a shot going to my right hand? That's all I want. Right. We laugh now because like, the guys know it. So when we're dummying it in practice and you know they've got to run like, 0.3 miles just to get their one shot and then you let them get that one shot and you say yeah but you messed up on this very beginning part so let's do that one over again and then you get the look and it drives them crazy um so you know we have fun with it as well we've we've talked uh we've talked a bunch jj and i talked a bunch about the parody in both conferences this year has it made your prep any different in terms of just i mean a, a good example of this would be like the magic in the east right now who are you know probably not a playoff team but they got a lot of really good players, and you can't fall asleep in that game where they'll come in and beat you. Is it's the NBA, so there's there's a, there's you know there's always going to be a version of this. But does it feel particularly um, different this year in any way? Yeah, I mean the league is in an unbelievable place. You know, I'll say that first and foremost. Um, the talent level that's in the NBA right now, from top to bottom, uh, I mean I think it's dispersed really really well. And you know you look at the teams at the top. Um, and there's, you know, there's eight to 10 teams that you could say really have a shot to win a title this year. Uh, typically, you know, you go back and there's like three or four teams that you say have a legitimate chance. And, and what you're seeing is the talent level has increased in the league and it's been dispersed, um, you know, spread more evenly throughout the league a as well. And there's not those teams where you're just like, you know, they're just completely tanking, trying to rebuild. Um, and playing for, you know, the number one pick. I do think that, you know, the adjustment in the draft lottery uh, has been, you know, part of the cause of that because, you know, they know that it's not just based on record anymore. You're, uh, I think that's changed people's perspective and willingness to go out uh, and try to compete as well. Um, but, you know, I just think the game is in a great place. You know, you look at the skill set of these guys that are coming into the league now, uh, and even at young ages and, you know, with great size, you know, they're ball skilled. They can pass, they can shoot, they can play make. Like, I just think the league is in a very talented place right now. I love that that phrase, just the, the dispersion of talent, because I think the concentration of talent is so much wider than it was five years ago, 10 years ago. And overall, I think that's great for our league. You mentioned you think there's eight or 10 teams. Cleveland right now, Number 10 offensively, number one defensively, number two net. I would personally say you're one of those teams. I know uh, I know how coaches talk to their players. And I, 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 you know, I've been on teams where the only word that comes out of a coach's mouth is like, we're going to win a championship. We're going for a championship. We're going for a championship. Other coaches get really obsessed with the process. What are you telling your team right now about the ceiling and the process of the season and building towards the playoffs? I mean, we'll create that for ourselves is the message. Um, you know, we'll be as good as, you know, our execution and our experience will allow us to be. Um, you don't skip steps in this process, right? In our starting lineup right now, what Jared Allen is 24, um, Darius just turned 23, Isaac is 22, Evan is 21, I believe. 
Um, you know, so you're going to need some experience to go along with that. And I think Donovan is just 26 years old. So it, it's not one of those things that happens overnight. You know, it's how quickly we can learn lessons. Uh, we've proven that we could beat anybody. And then we've had some games where we've stunk it up and we've lost some games that we shouldn't have. Uh, so for us, it's all about, you know, the experiences and how quick we, we quickly we learn from those experiences. You know, we play teams, you know, like the Brooklyn's of the world, the Golden States, the Milwaukee's, like who have been through it and have players who have been through it. You know, how quickly do we take those lessons that we learn from those types of players and those types of games and apply it, you know, to ourselves? Uh, and, and that'll be our test. And how quickly we pass those tests will determine how far we can go. Coach, I had one more question for you, and that was just on load management, which has been a hot topic issue around the NBA for several seasons now. Um, internally, I, I would assume there's communication with the performance staff and with the front office. Do coaches, do you, as coaches, uh, other coaches, other staff coaches, do you lament this era of load, load management? I, I would assume as a coach, night to night, not necessarily knowing who's going to be on, who's going to be off. Um, I mean, as early as six years ago, if you were not injured, a coach knew night to night, like this guy's going to play, this guy's going to play. He didn't get hurt in practice yesterday. He's going to play tomorrow. He didn't get hurt in the game last night. He's going to play in the back-to-back. -back. You know, th th there, there has to be some level of frustration. And on that note, do you think that there is a good solution for this? Yeah, you know, coach's frustration comes, like you said, game by game. Right. Like I think when coaches sit back and we look at the big picture, you know, if you're able to have your best player, you know, typically those guys, you know, you think about back in the day, like a 10 year career was a long career for a superstar who was playing 82 games a night. You've got guys that are making it to 20 years now uh, and, you know, still being able to play at a relatively high level. You know, we're talking about LeBron, obviously, which is playing at a high, high level. But, you know, you have guys who are extending their career to 15 years, 17 years. So now you have your guys for, you know, more seasons, which obviously gives you a better opportunity to win long term. You know what? As a coach in the moment, your frustration comes because, you know, you want your best players on the floor for as long as they possibly can be on the floor. You want them as many games as possible so that you can have that consistency and know what you're going to get. Uh, and it's been different for me. You know what I mean? Like I grew up uh, old school NBA where, you know, it was a badge of honor to play 82 games and guys goal was every year to go out and play 82 games. I think last year there may have been five or six guys who played 82 games. Right. So it's been an adjustment for me. Uh, but when I look at it from the big picture, you know, as a fan of the NBA, if your favorite players or the greatest players on the planet can find a way to get, you know, five more years or eight more years or whatever it may be, even if it's, you know, one or two more years, um, you know, that's great for the game of basketball. And I think, you know, you want to find that kind of give and take. But uh, I think when you look at the big picture and you're able to extend guys careers and again, we're talking about the game of basketball being at a great place. It's because some of those veteran guys have been able to play longer, last longer, and help teams for a longer period of time. No, it's it's a it's a valid point, um, Coach. We have greatly appreciated the time. I uh, wanted to wait to the end to bring this up, but I did have my career high against you and the Houston Rockets, <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate the open looks. <laughs> uh, we let you get left right. I, I remember we let you get all left night. right. It was left yeah. right all night. I know, Coach. Always rooting for you. Thanks for the time, bud. Thanks, I appreciate you guys. Right. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah.